Excellent. Hello everyone and welcome to Probing Paul. This is my monthly Q&A series where I answer the questions that you guys have asked. All of the questions I'm answering this month were taken from last month's video. So go ahead and check out my Probing Paul playlist. There you can see many of them going back to when I switched from dark mode. You can see that transition there. So leave me your questions down in the comment section if you want me to answer them next month. And without further ado, let's get into the first question. This one was asked by Joskar864. He says, hey Paul, is it still worth buying a 2070 Super or better? Uh, or should I wait for the new graphics cards, the NVIDIA 30 series that has been promised? I love your videos. Thank you very much, Joskar. Joskar? First off, I should point out, this is the consummate question when it comes to building or upgrading a computer. Should I buy now? Should I wait? The universal response is that no matter when you buy, there will always be something new on their horizon, whether it's in a month or six months or a year, and that will launch and then your computer will be outdated and you'll need to spend more money to upgrade it if you want the newest and fanciest stuff. With that in mind, the general advice is often you should just buy now. If you've got the money, if you know what you want, if you know the parts you're looking at will provide you some sort of meaningful upgrade when it comes to the frame rate you're getting in your games or the the speed at which you can render out videos, then you should just dive in and buy it. That said, if you know something's coming out in a month or in two months, and you know it's going to be a big upgrade, a generational change, like uh, on the CPU side, going to a brand new architecture with a brand new series, often with a brand new socket and motherboard, or on the GPU side, when they're changing and switching to a smaller manufacturing process, they're supposed to be going from, I believe, 12 nanometer down to eight nanometer with these newest uh, RTX 3000 series of GPUs that are still very very much in the rumor phase right now. Everything we're talking about right now is just rumored. Nothing has been confirmed by NVIDIA. It is, however, reasonable to assume that NVIDIA is going to be launching a next generation of graphics cards. And yes, they should be based on a newer manufacturing process and a new GPU microarchitecture, which could provide a significant uplift in performance. The new architecture is codenamed Ampere at this point. But beyond that, there is really not too much that is officially, officially confirmed. So we're relying on rumors and uh, benchmarks that have leaked out through through benchmark aggregate websites and that sort of thing. I will point you guys over to this Tech Radar article, it's linked in the description, that goes over some of the release date rumors, spec rumors and everything, and it's, it's sort of gathered together the reasonable ones right now with links going to the relevant articles. I highly recommend checking out the article if you wanna read some more details, but the best educated guess that we can make right now is around September of 2020, which isn't too far away. We're already in July, so that's August, September. That's about two months, two and a half months maybe. So if you're really in that position where you have 500 or 600 or 800 bucks to spend on a graphics card right now, you're really on the cusp of the recommendation of buy because you have the money right now and you can get something that you can use right now versus wait for that next generation that is theoretically just on the horizon. If Nvidia would come out with something, something more solid, then I could give you guys a more solid recommendation, but really we're dealing with speculation and rumor at this point. So take all this information with a grain of salt, my advice included, and hopefully we'll have something more solid to go on soon. Next question here from that bite guy 87 Hey Paul, love the videos. Thank you very much, bite guy. I'm more. I'm a more recent sub. I've gone back and watched almost all your vids. Just a quick question. I've been doing video editing and rendering using an AMD uh, Ryzen 5 3600 and a, I believe he means RTX 2060, which is a nice pairing, by the way. A nice bang for the buck. But that bite guy 87 is doing video editing and he wants to know what the best course is for an upgrade path from where he's at. The other relevant information that I don't have when it comes to a video editing system is what memory configuration you're using right now and what storage configuration that you're using right now. So let me run down the list. Your RTX 2060, I think you're just fine with right now. You could deal with something like a 2060 Super or better that would give you a little bit more VRAM to work with, but I think that would just be a marginal improvement to your actual video editing performance of your system. Your CPU could of course be upgraded. You have a six core, 12 thread processor and there are eight core, 12 core and 16 core variants available on the platform that you're currently on. That would improve your rendering time. So once you've done all of your editing and you hit render and you walk away from your computer. With more cores and threads, it's just gonna render in you know eight minutes instead of 10 or something like that. What might actually improve your experience while you're editing though and scrubbing through a timeline and everything is going to be possibly your storage and your memory configuration. I would recommend 32 gigs of memory at minimum for a video editing setup. But that said, monitor your uh, memory usage while you're editing depending on the complexity of the project you're using and whether you're diving into something like After Effects, you may not be using more than 16 or 20 gigs. But make sure you've got at least 32 and then consider an 
an upgrade to 64 if you're actually using all of that up. Second part, of course, is going to be your storage configuration. And the ideal situation is to have one SSD that has your operating system, Windows 10, as well as your installation of your video editing software like Adobe Premiere. One SSD, and ideally a really super fast one uh, that has all of your raw storage on it, your raw footage that you're editing from. And then another SSD that is operating as a cache drive. And that's what your video editing software will write temporary data to if it needs to do a pre-render of something, for example. So again, without knowing your full system specs, it's hard to say which of those things you should upgrade, but hopefully this gives you a better idea of which upgrades would affect things like your render time versus which upgrades would affect things like actually editing and scrubbing through a timeline. The final recommendation though, to edit more smoothly and to give yourself a better experience overall is to take your raw footage and immediately re-render it as a proxy. Uh, Adobe Premiere has a function that can do this automatically. Essentially what you're doing though is taking your raw high resolution video files that would take some level of decoding by your processor in order to display on screen. And you're re-encoding that into a lower resolution format that's also lossless. That means that your computer can just read the video and show it without having to do any uh, decoding on the fly. I'm not gonna explain how to do that here. I would recommend Taryn's videos uh, from LMG. Uh, he has some really, really in-depth tutorials on how to set all that stuff up, but hopefully that gives you something to go on. Thank you very much to that bite guy 87 And the next question here is from Mark Vaughn. Hey Paul, thanks for the great content. You're welcome, Mark, thank you. Uh, new to PC building, I hear everyone say that front panel audio is garbage. What are my other options? My headset has a different connector than the input on the back IO panel. Should I just buy an adapter, a DAC, an audio interface, please help. So if you guys wanna know something stupid that I discovered about motherboards uh, some years ago that I don't think is very widely known, it's that uh, you might have a separate audio device for the analog outputs here on the back of your motherboard than you do for what's being powered through your front panel audio, which is usually an FP audio connector, which is down here on the bottom of the board. So what that can often mean is you might have a motherboard that advertises like high-end audio and audio grade capacitors used and everything like that. But then if you plug in front panel audio and connect your mic and headphone jack to your front panel uh, mic and headphone jack ports on your case, you're not even taking advantage of all of that hardware there because it's probably got a separate sound device that's lower quality that's powering those front panel jacks. That is one reason front panel audio can suck. Another reason is that you're taking an analog signal and you're wiring it through your computer case, which is often very electrically noisy. An analog signal is very much subject to interference, so this can often lead to buzzing or other weird issues when you plug into front panel audio with your mic and headphone. So my advice for people is to typically just plug in analog connections to the analog sound outputs on the back of the motherboard, or alternatively, if that's not working well for you, or if you want a better solution, invest in an external DAC, uh, which would often connect via USB, and that would take your digital signal via USB and then do the digital to analog conversion externally in a separate box, which can often remove a lot of that uh, interference noise, and external dedicated boxes can often have much higher internal components. This is not an external DAC, it's a headphone amplifier that takes an analog signal and amplifies it, amplifies it, but uh, it's made by Mayflower Electronics and they make external DACs as well, which is why I thought it would make a good visual aid. If you wanna to get to the fundamentals, your question should be, where does the conversion happen from digital to analog? If it's a digital signal, it can be fairly well protected. And then once it gets to the point where it's converted to analog, that's where the quality matters of the components being used. And that's where something like an external DAC might provide you with a much better final experience, especially if you have really nice headphones or something like that, than the integrated audio on a motherboard. The final part of your question is the one that I think is a little bit weird, which is that you say your headset has different connectors than the back IO panel. Most headsets usually split out to a mic and a headphone jack if they're an analog connection. And that you would just plug into the eighth inch audio jack here for the headphones and then the eighth inch mic jack for your microphone. I have seen some motherboards that have a quarter inch rather than an eighth inch jack there. And for that, you could potentially use a quarter inch to eighth inch adapter. Or it could be that uh, your headset uses a USB adapter. And uh, in that case, you can just plug that USB adapter into just about any USB jack on your computer and it should work. Next question by Anthony Joseph Landman. And this is a long one with a couple questions. I'm mainly gonna focus on the central question here, but thank you, Anthony, for your uh, well thought out question and saying you love the channel. I appreciate that. Your second question about focusing on audio hardware, refer to the question I just answered before this. That's about as far as I'm gonna get with it right now. More importantly though, you're asking about an extra power input for the CPU on your motherboard. Uh, this is pretty common actually. So pretty much all motherboards these days are gonna have some form of supplemental power for your CPU up here. This was introduced a long time ago and originally it was just a four pin connector. Really what you have here is a bunch of 12 volt connections from the power supply that are feeding power from a 12 volt rail. By adding additional plugs there, they can feed more power overall to 
the power delivery because there's a limit to how much power can be fed through a single wire. So the vast majority of motherboards you'll deal with right now or that you buy currently if you're building your own system are gonna have at least a single eight pin supplemental power connector up there and then potentially they might have another one. So this motherboard also has an extra four pin there or sometimes you'll see an eight plus eight. All this has to do with the power delivery configuration here and these can be built in different ways. There is minimum specifications that are required in order to just make a CPU work and run as it should. But then there's overclocking and when you overclock, the CPU is gonna draw more power than it would by default. So a motherboard's VRMs or power delivery configuration might be built to provide 150% or 200% of what the CPU actual, actually needs. And that's simply to have the power there for when the CPU asks for it. And if a motherboard's VRMs are overbuilt to a degree where a standard eight pin connection isn't gonna be able to provide enough, enough amperage, then they might add more, uh, such as an extra four pin or an extra eight pin. The upshot for you and anyone who has bought maybe a more budget power supply where you've only got a single eight pin connector is that you're probably just fine as long as you're not overclocking. As long as you connect power to that main eight pin connector, then you should be just fine. And as long as you're not overclocking, you'll never get to the point where you need the extra amperage provided by those extra power plugs. There are also adapters you can get for like Molex plugs coming from your power supply that would just again provide more wires coming from the 12 volt reel in your power supply over to those connections. But honestly, if your motherboard doesn't have like an eight pin and a four pin or an eight pin and an eight pin for the CPU, you might consider upgrading your power supply so you can plug those in if you do decide to get into overclocking. Thank you though, Anthony. The next question is from Oddball. Uh, hey Paul, I've been enjoying your videos for some time. I really liked it when you took us through your kitchen remodel, even though I'm here for PC related stuff. Can we expect more content like that in the future? Do you have anything planned? Uh, and weren't you talking about updating the wall mounted PC? So I can quickly answer this. Uh, first off, when it comes to the remodel, we don't have any major plans like that coming up soon. My next steps were all going to be outside and uh, setting up my outdoor covered area that I have over here, which is currently still being used for storage. Because we're so limited on the amount of help we have for childcare and stuff like that right now, though, I have had my hands full just uh, taking care of baby and trying to keep things relatively clean and orderly around here. I have plans for the backyard. I have plans for lots of stuff, and I will probably be covering that to some degree, although I do want to keep those videos spaced out a little bit more from the regular tech content because I know they're a little bit out of line with the usual stuff I talk about. As for the HTPC, yes, I really want to move forward with that one too, and I have some shelves to build in there, so I want to set up the home theater area. Just recently did a television upgrade there with the new LG OLED, so that's been a nice bump up, but now I'm really like, man, I really want to get to that woodworking stuff, shelving and all that, so hopefully I can get to it soon. I think really the next steps are, uh, I, I need to clear out this side yard area, so I, I hope I can get to that soon. Thank you for your question though. Next question from Con Vepidus. Uh, hey, been watching you from Australia. Hey, thanks for watching from all the way over there in, in, in Australia. Love the channel and all the work you do. Uh, I have a question. I want to go from Intel to AMD. What are the key things I need to buy? I like this question because it's fairly straightforward. So if you're talking about upgrading a, an existing computer from an Intel platform to an AMD platform, really the only things you're gonna need are a new motherboard. You're gonna need a socket AM4 motherboard for the current generation. And of course, that's a new Ryzen CPU that will slot into that motherboard. The current generation of memory, and this has been the same on Intel for some time, is DDR4. So as long as you have DDR4 memory in your Intel system, you probably can switch it over to your new AMD system. You might consider upgrading that memory to a faster speed kit down the line at some point, but as long as you're at 3,000, 3,200 or faster, you should be just fine for most Ryzen setups. Beyond that, all things being equal, as long as you're using the same form factor with an ATX case and everything, everything else should work. Uh, your storage, your case, your power supply is all compatible with both an Intel and an AMD system. And honestly, I'd say worst case scenario is if you have a much older Intel system that has DDR3 memory or something like that, then you would just need to get new DDR4 memory to pair with it as well. Lastly, if you're not familiar, uh, Intel uses LGA type sockets and AMD AMD uses PGA type sockets, so there's a slight variation to the pins, uh, whether they're on the CPU or whether they're on the motherboard. Check out my LGA versus PGA video for a little bit more on that. Next question from Nick Thorne. Uh, thanks for answering my question a couple months ago about how much footage you take to produce a probing Paul video. Uh, thanks, Nick, and I think Joe had a fun time editing that part as well. You mentioned your GH5 camera the last couple weeks. I was wondering if you record on the camera and transfer it to your PC, or if you use the GH5 as a cam and do a capture configuration. I kind of do half and half, Nick. I have certain types of videos, certain style videos that I typically record sitting right here where I talk to the camera and everything. Those I like, and this video is included, I capture 
capture directly to my capture system over here. And usually that means I'm recording at 1080p, 60 frames per second. Now when I'm doing a build video or something like that, and I'm recording over here, I will often use dual cameras. So to set up to capture directly with something like that, with cameras moving around and having HDMI cable strung across just isn't quite as practical. So I haven't set that up to capture directly now, even though I do have the capability to capture in 4K on these computers. So for that, I usually just record directly to the SD card, transfer it to the system, and then edit from there. Capturing directly can be really convenient because it can do on the fly encoding, so you can end up with much smaller file sizes, for example. Just practically speaking, when I'm using multiple cameras, uh, I'd rather capture directly to the cameras. You also have the capability of recording to the camera while you're capturing to the system, that's an option too. But if you'd like to know, for any given video, uh, just looking if it's 1080-60, I probably captured to the computer, and if it's 4K 30, then I probably recorded it on my cameras. This is more of a, a couple comments, and there were actually multiple comments like this in the last video, just saying timestamps on the vids. Uh, the people appreciate that. Thank you, and I'm gonna continue to do that. I've been trying to do that wherever possible. Now that when you add timestamps to the description, it takes the bar that you're scrubbing through on YouTube and actually puts it there. I think it's a really convenient time saver for just jumping ahead to the stuff that you want to hear about, so I'm gonna keep doing it as often as possible. I've even been going into the live shows Provided, of course, that the timestamps were already put together by an awesome contributor like Your Everyday Tech who has been doing timestamps for our live shows, but I'll take those and I'll drop them into the video description so it adds timestamps for that as well. Uh, but I'm glad you guys appreciate that. I will continue to do it. Last questions here, again, were more uh, like responses to the last video because I talked about my favorite wallpaper site, Interface Lift, going down or not being available anymore, so I asked for some recommendations. Smucky recommended the Wallpaper Engine app on Steam, Deviant Art, perhaps, or Wallpaper Abyss. Steve Mayfield, as well as a few other people, recommended wallhaven.cc. So here's Wallpaper Abyss, which apparently has like 850,000 wallpapers available. Seems to be a lot of anime themed stuff here. Oh, uh, there's a really cool kind of stylized uh, picture of Kyoto. This actually reminds me of some place I've been in Kyoto. These are potentially subject to copyright and all that stuff, so I'm trying not to dwell, dwell on them too much, but uh, here's a look at wallhaven.cc. Again, you can search up here. Oh, look at this, snails and shrooms. That one's it's trippy. So here's a convenient thing for a wallpaper site to have. Uh, I have some ultra wide monitors and getting uh, wallpaper made for that can help from weird crops. That said, I'll usually just go for the highest res resolution 16 by nine or better. So let's just see if we got some 4K options. Hey, this one's kind of my style. I like roads, you know, they show they show the potential of where you might go and where you've been and all that stuff. So let's save this one. And then that final recommendation was Wallpaper Engine, which is actually uh, like a game, or I mean an app or whatever uh, that's available on Steam. It costs $3.99 and I bought it. All right, so I'm not gonna dive into a tutorial or anything because this is my first time using this software. So look, I just chose beach and now my background wallpaper is animated with a beach. I'm not even showing you guys the full screen, but you can you can get the basic idea there, right? Look, we've also got deep space. So I guess I guess you can just sort of choose these with the check boxes and, and then it will enable them and stuff, but uh, that's pretty cool. Actually, that kind of is pretty cool. All right, I'm glad I discovered this. And perhaps now you guys have discovered it too. Uh, that's Wallpaper Engine, available on Steam for about four bucks. That's all for this video though, guys. Thank you so much for watching. This has been Probing Paul episode number 49. And of course, once again, if you have questions for me, leave them in the comments section below and perhaps I will answer them next month. Leave a thumbs up on this video on your way out if you enjoyed it and check out my store at paulshardware.net if you wanna buy shirts, mugs, pint glasses, or other sweet merch to help support my channel and get yourself sweet merch. That sounds like a win-win to me. Thanks again for watching, guys. We'll see you in the next one.